I've got quite a bit of material here, so uh, please pay attention and I'll go through it uh, as expeditiously as I can. Uh, I've called it Oil Sands Tailings, Challenges to Managing Fluid Tailings. By way of outline, uh, this presentation will look at the origin of fluid tailings and how they are formed, the historical context uh, of tailings management, <clears throat> the types of deposits for incorporating fluid tailings into the closure landscape, and a discussion on the nature of fines, the clay content, and the properties at the root of the management challenge. So oil sands deposits contain clay, uh, but the clay is not evenly distributed. Much of it is contained in interbedded layers that you can see on the mine face and in the core hole samples on the left. The in situ deposits are a dense sand matrix infused with bitumen. The grains of sand are surrounded by a water lens called conate water. And the water envelope makes the water extraction process function very easily. And it also contains a good portion of the fine clays. Some of the clay rich, rich lenses may only be centimeters thick. They can be discontinuous or on a sloped plane dissecting the mining bench. This shows the variability that commonly occurs in the McMurray Formation. <clears throat> Notice the difference in core holes only 100 meters apart. If we could mine to exclude the clay lenses, the water extraction process could be more efficient and uh, I wouldn't be here talking to you about fluid tailings. However, the mining equipment is very large and selective rejection of these thin clay lenses has not been practical. So the huge scale of, uh, of mining limits selectivity. When they were first used in the oil sands, bucket wheel excavators had little ability to reject central zones of clay-rich low grade within their operating bench. Drag lines did have the ability to cast center reject, but the large bucket size with the operator far above the mid face meant only that layers were, that were meters thick could uh, be rejected. Electric cable shovels are the workhorse of today's mining and they normally take a full sweep from the bench level to the top of the face with a height of about 15 to 17 meters. Hydraulic shovels do have the ability to enter the face mid-level to reject uh, layers of low-grade or siltstone slabs, making them useful for irregular ore bodies. So with the large shovels in use today, oil sand, including any interbedded clay shale, is excavated from the face and conveyed by truck to the ore preparation plant. Here it is crushed, then mixed with hot water and a fines dispersant, which is usually sodium hydroxide, and a slurry pipeline provides ore conditioning as well as transport to the extraction separation system. Here the bitumen is recovered through flotation, and the tailings are pumped as a slurry to the tailings disposal area. Here's a picture of two extraction processing trains that handle a total of about 10 tons per second of oil sand slurry. 10 tons a second. Water-based bitumen extraction requires that the slurry be sufficiently dilute to allow separation and flotation. And this makes the fines prone to segregation. When the tailings are discharged, some of the fine clays in the slurry run off the sand beach into the water recycle pond. The segregated fines settle slowly to the pond bottom. After a year or two, they reach about 30% solids by mass. The industry, uh, as you know, calls this muddy water mature fine tailings, or MFT. After a number of years, fine tailings reach about 30 to 40% solids, after which the density increases extremely slowly with most of the increase in an active pond coming from in-migration of silts rather than consolidation. Normally, the pond construction method is to raise the containment dikes with sand cell construction, then discharge most of the sand to beaches on the interior of the pond shell. Although the outer shell is sometimes constructed from overburden rather than sand cells. The mechanism for entrapment of fines in the cells and beaches and the tolerance for higher fines in the constructed containment 
are the subject of intensive investigation by the industry as this is the only no added cost method for disposal. It currently takes care of over half of the fines. So I'll talk more about this in my second presentation. By volume and far and away by mass, sand makes up the most of the oil sand tailings. But the fluid tailings, or MFT, present the greatest challenge to sustainable mine closure. The formation and accumulation and the resistance to settlement of fluid fine tailings came as a surprise after the startup of the GCOS operation. To the credit of the geotechnical engineers of the day, the design of a 10-meter tow dike at the base of the sand beaching operation was converted to a safe containment dam, ultimately raised to about 100 meters. How much was known about this phenomenon by the Syncru joint venture is unclear. They had operated the Mildred Lake pilot plant from 1959 to 1963, which established the basic mining, extraction, and froth treatment processes used in these first two commercial operations. Nevertheless, by the time the Syncrude operation was underway, a basic planning parameter was to retain sufficient pit void to transfer and contain the volumes of fluid tailings. This would provide safe geotechnical sequestration and allow decommissioning of the tailings containment dams built to recycle water and settle the fines. Pit Lake Research and Development and the Base Mine Lake demonstration recently inaugurated responded to the need to incorporate fluid tailings into the closure landscape and into the surface hydrology. This method has had the most development and the Base Mine Lake is the largest of all commercial demonstrations to date but it won't take care of all the volumes of, on all the sites, and we need to commercialize a number of other methods. Today, the total industry has about 850, or now over 900 cubic, uh, million cubic meters of fluid tailings, mostly in above-grade containment dams. This volume continues to grow as the industry expands, and the established operations take the time to ramp up methods to permanently dispose of tailings and deposits that will be components of a sustainable landscape. Fines that are not naturally captured in sand or sequestered in pit lakes need to be dewatered to a state that will ultimately support a dry landform. Methods that have currently been developed either mix the fines with sand for dewatering or use a polymer flocculant to provide initial dewatering followed by other means to complete the process, ultimately drying or self-weight consolidation. So this slide lists the processes and the methods that are now in operation or have been large-scale field tested. Area constraints, energy use, and costs suggest that most fluid tailings will need to be disposed of in deep deposits, with or without sand. And this makes consolidation behavior a, uh, a, a central issue for the industry to understand and contend with. Material properties and deposit design are critical to deep deposit consolidation time and reclamation. All fines are not created equal. The industry practice has been to divide sand and fines at 44 micrometers. However, only a small fraction of the 44 micron fines generate the, vo the volumes of fluid tailings. Clay content and clay types dominate the behavior of fluid tailings and deep deposit dewatering. The analytical tools of the trade for tailings engineers include Atterberg limits, methylene blue, which measures clay surface area, and direct clay mineralogy determination, values used to predict deposit behavior. Here's a chart that contains millions of dollars worth of data. On the left, you'll see a sample of extraction fines from a cyclone overflow that has been allowed to settle for 18 days with no chemical addition. This was a particularly rich, clay-rich oil sand. Uh, I've never seen anything higher. There's only a millimeter or two of clear water on top, but note there's four distinct layers of different clay materials. 
any fast settling silts or, or sand, of which there was very little in this sample, are settled at the bottom and are not visible, and they don't occupy fluid tailings volume. In a dynamic pond, these different materials, along with silts, settle into each other. The chart on the right plots clay content against plasticity index. The material in the cylinder is in the range of the rusty red uh, squares at uh, the upper right uh, of the chart. In other words, that cyclone overflow was more clay than most mature fine tailings. Looking at uh, MFT in the same pond shows that a ton of MFT near the top of the, mu uh, of the mud line can have twice the clay and volume generation contribution as a ton at taken at depth, 40 meters down. For other sources of fines, down on the bottom here, taken directly from ore, uh, the difference is much greater. As I mentioned earlier, deep deposits will need to be a major part of most sites' fines management. Final dewatering of these deposits through self-weight consolidation will take time. Dewatering occurs mostly through upward drainage. The behavior of these deposits is a function of depth and material properties. The upper part of the deposit will remain loose and weak until a surcharge is applied, such as a sand cap. Several uh, capping techniques can be envisaged. Sand raining, which has been talked about earlier in this conference, through a layer of water has been used for soft deposits in other part of the parts of the world notably uh, for the Singapore airport construction, which I believe Nordy has talked about in, in previous, previous uh, conferences. Placing thin annual layers of sand over a frozen surface in winter might also be practical. Or allowing a crust to form through freeze-thaw and drying to provide access to the surface for light equipment. Rim and surface dishing, ditching could be used to accelerate the growth of a desiccated cap. In any event, a surcharge cap is essential to complete consolidation. Hydraulic conductivity is the most critical factor to the consolidation behavior of these clay-dominated deposits. Differences in compressibility do not appear to be large on a multi-cycle log chart. However, small differences in these properties can lead to substantial differences in rates of consolidation and years of settlement time in the uh, deep deposits. Note that the upper point in the chart flow rate is on the order of a meter per day, while near the bottom we're looking at a few millimeters per year. This is the same data enlarged for the zone of load void ratios. The bottom green line is a deep deposit of untreated MFT, and the other lines are a back analysis of field deposits treated with polymer flocculants. The difference in hydraulic conductivity relates to the clay content. Earlier, you heard a discussion about the effect of bitumen in, uh, in these fines deposits. So this was actually looked at where uh, all of the bitumen uh, was removed. Here's a chart that shows the improvement effect of complete removal of bitumen from MFT. What we need to better understand is what improvement would result through partial levels of bitumen removal, which would obviously be more practical than this, this lab test. <clears throat> Recently, uh, we completed an analysis on a syncrude field thickening trial completed in 2005 and 2006 using tailings fines from oil sand with very high clay content that I showed you earlier with the, uh, with the cylinder sample. This was a great piece of work, a great piece of field uh, execution by Syncrude, and uh, we didn't really realize how great until Total sponsored Bill and I to do a, uh, a more thorough analysis of the work. The feed was supplied at full commercial rates from cyclone overflow, from two 5,000 ton an hour extraction tailing lines, three, power, th a three stage power uh, flocculation system with two uh, flocculants, where a flocculant and a coagulant was performed right at the beach, di beach discharge. Two deposits were placed, 
and the consolidation tracked over the following year. Among other things, this uh, demonstration proved that you don't need a thickener to effectively thicken. If warm water recovery or, or heat is your stick, then you do need a thickener. But this was done very effectively with the flocculator right at the beach deposit. These deposits were fully instrument for instrumented for temperature, settlement, and pore pressure. Samples were taken at several intervals, and because of the rapid fill and the expression of water through the deposit over the winter, essentially no freezing into the solid zone occurred. But in the warm, dry spring of 2006, a considerable crust formed within a few weeks. The observed consolidation behavior was used to set model parameters for a deep deposit commercial type deposit and the model results compared with other uh, parameters derived from conventional thickener deposits. We wanted to see how these results lined up with clay content. The Aurora thickener demonstration deposits from 2002 and 2003 and the Shell Cell 1 test deposits were used for comparison. You can see the wide range of clay contents in these deposits. Successful flocculation and deposition of the high clay material in the ILTT points to the robustness of the flocculation process used for that demonstration. Here's a model projection for deposit placement of close to three tons per square meter per year over a period of 10 years using these parameters. So the filling period is modeled through to year 10 with the solids content on the x-axis, the deposit height or depth on the y-axis. As you can see, solids content on the surface only increases once a load is applied. By year 22, the deposit surface is within one and a half meters of ultimate settlement, which is attained in about year 85. For monitoring actual deposit behavior against modeled projections, two additional measures can be employed. Measurement of deposit strength progression, and <clears throat> pore pressure dissipation. Once the deposit has been completed, an additional direct measure becomes practical. Settlement of the deposit surface can be measured directly along with measures such as pore pressure dissipation. Settlement is, after all, the critical parameter for final reclamation readiness. The one, and a, the one and a half uh, meter guideline is arbitrary and not an absolute necessity. It's just a point where establishment of surface hydrology should be relatively straightforward. Much greater residual settlement will require more per, uh, precaution in design and placement of the landform and the outlet drainage channel to ensure that no large perched water body materializes from future settlement. Now looking at the effect of deposit clay properties on settlement time and using back-analyzed geotechnical properties from the test deposits, you can see that the modeled settlement times line up well with clay content. The modeled cases shown previously, previously use the deepest deposit with the lowest clay content. With, with very high clay contents, one of three things will be needed. The deposit can be held to a shallower depth, Final surface drainage contouring can be postponed for a longer time period, or the surface design must account for post-closure settlement. I'd like to leave this topic uh, with, with you with a preview of, uh, of work that COSIA is undertaking to develop a comprehensive process for the management of fluid tailings. The process is made up of two key management monitoring and reporting of progress against plans. The first is to track the volume of fluid tailings held within containment dams to ensure that the total fines management process and the use of all processes in play is keeping up with plans and commitments. The second is to monitor deposit formation and behavior to ensure that fines disposal processes are doing their job. Criteria for key measurement and reporting appropriate to each deposit type are being developed along with protocols for each measurement parameter to be used. This performance process is targeted at progressive management of fluid tailings toward meeting mine closure requirements. It builds upon the guide for fluid tailings management completed for the COSIA last year 
and relies upon the measurement protocols being developed. It also relies on the MAC guidelines on tailings management, which deal with aspects for managing conventional tailings dams and for putting in place audit and assessment processes, independent audit and assessment processes. Criteria for delicensing of oil sand tailings dams were issued in September, and work is underway on proposed additions to the Mine Financial Security Program to reflect fluid tailings. And the COSIA Water Priority uh, Group are, uh, have initiated work on standards for lease, release water from oil sand sites. Together, these documents will make up a comprehensive set of practices for the management of all tailings, and particularly fluid tailings for the industry. So in summary, a comprehensive set of industry practices for all oil sand tailings management is near completion. Deep deposits with fines dominated behavior will be key to effective fluid tailings management. Material properties and deposit geometry will govern the timelines for settlement, and deposit settlement time is a key consideration for deposit location and closure design. 